Hey guys. Cannot wait to do this live. Let's see. Okay. All right. All right. So today we're going to be talking about handling criticism and maintaining confidence as a writer. And before we get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Jessica Tanner and I'm a screenplay consultant, screenwriting coach, and I help screenwriters craft sellable scripts that command industry attention. And I also help creative writers get unblocked when it comes to their creativity. I help you when it comes to getting past perfectionism, getting past fear, which, you know, all of these tend to be root causes when it comes to creativity. And it's often the culprit behind why a lot of people have amazing ideas, but they just don't create. And they might have projects that they've been ignoring for years and they've been collecting dust and they keep thinking, oh, I want to write. I want to, you know, share my stories with the world or I want to write a book of poems or an anthology, a novel, a screenplay. And they're letting their over analytical brain just get in the way of all that stuff. So that's what I come in and I help you with. But today I want to talk about you could say it's kind of a sensitive topic when it comes to criticism in our writing. So a lot of us are married to our ideas, myself included, because I mean, come on, it's our ideas. And we often have a deep connection to the stories that we tell. Sometimes we tell stories because we're just interested in the topic and we want to play around with that genre. But a lot of the time we tell stories because we resonate with them. It might be directly related to something we went through, something a friend went through, something a loved one experienced, right? So we have a deep emotional connection with the stories that we tell and with the stories that we create. So naturally, when we're met with criticism, we feel like we just got, you know, pounded in the chest, right? We feel like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're talking about my artwork like that. I can't believe they're telling me I need to fix this. They're telling me that how I went about this, that there's a better way. And a lot of people don't understand that criticism, it really depends on the type of criticism that you get. And a lot of people confuse constructive criticism with just plain old criticism. And I'll tell you right now, constructive criticism is your best, your best bet. That's what you want. You want to be able to identify, okay, who is giving me the best advice? Who is giving me the best instruction who is giving me strategies who is giving me clarity so that i can go back into my rewrite confidently right whereas just criticism that's when somebody tells you like oh your script sucks and they don't give you any strategies they don't give you any room to grow they just tell you pretty much like oh well you're a horrible writer and da, da 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 and depending on the person they might even tell you to quit writing altogether that it'll never happen for you and there's a lot of people like that in these spaces unfortunately that will kill people's creativity before they even get their feet wet with it and i'll tell you you know the main thing that you have to do is recognize these people for who they are and then make a conscious effort to seek out people that will really give you solid advice and they'll actually give you a why behind it and here's another way that you'll know their goal isn't to tear you down their goal is actually to give you what you want their goal is really to give you what is going to help your screenplay get better, what's going to help your book get better, 
sorry guys, what's going to help your p book of poems get better, your novel, whatever it is. And that's what you want to aim for. So all the people that you've encountered that told you, oh, you're never going to be able to write, you can't do this, like writing can't be taught, like people are born with that. A lot of it is noise. I've even had people tell me that, like, oh, you can't teach screenwriting. You can't teach people how to be creative. No, I believe that you can. I've seen it with my own eyes. I have seen people come to me with their first screenplay and they were green, you know, they were new. They had no idea what they were doing. And then once I read their script, provided them with notes, gave them strategy, they were able to then go back and implement what we talked about. And with each rewrite, guess what? They got better. They got better with practice, consistency, and time. And that's really what you need. They got better, let me say it again. They got better with consistency, time and practice right and that's really what beats out just plain talent because there are talented people out here that might be great but they might not have the work ethic so you have to factor that in as well and the reason I want to talk about this topic is because you know we put our heart and soul into our work and that can make it tough when we face that criticism and ah, oh, thank you <laughs> Yeah, I got them from, uh, where did I get them from? NYZ Accessory Shop. She's awesome. Black-owned business. I love supporting black-owned businesses when I can. And <clears throat> yeah, like when you get that criticism, it's easy to feel, you know, defeated, deflated. And then you start questioning yourself, like, should I really be doing this? And we end up putting these unrealistic expectations on ourselves, And we end up saying oh, well, maybe I'm in the wrong thing. Maybe, you know, I'm not good at it, like right out the gate. I don't know what I'm doing right out the gate. So I should quit. I should just, you know, leave it alone. I shouldn't even attempt to do this. And that's the wrong approach. It just means that you're new to it. You have to practice. You have to get the knowledge. You have to follow people in that space and learn what they already know. And this trips up a lot of people because they feel like, well, if I'm not the smartest person in the room, I'm not meant to be there. No, you don't want to be the, the smartest person in the room because if you are, that means that you're not around people that can teach you anything new. You're not in an environment where you can broaden your horizon, where you can hear different perspectives, where you can learn how to be more innovative, right? And these are some common scenarios where, you know, not being able to balance that criticism, which we're talking about constructive, right? We're not able to balance that criticism with confidence and when our confidence is decreased it also decreases what our creativity and that's what we don't want so i have five ways that not having your confidence and balance can mess you up creatively so number one the scenario where you might not make it in a screenwriting competition or even you know, a poetry competition or a novel competition, whatever it is, after putting in weeks or months of effort, right? You enter that competition and then maybe a few months later you hear back and you didn't win, right? And a lot of us, you know, because we're human, that makes us question our talent. That makes us go, oh my gosh, I never get, you know, even a quarter finalist, you know, recognition. I never, you know, make it to the finals. I never win. And yeah, thanks, Courtney. I never, you know, make it all the way up. I'm never able to really do what I need to do. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I, I keep hitting this brick wall. And we end up talking horribly to ourselves. Remember yesterday, we talked about self-compassion and how that negative self-talk, the more you do that, it kills your confidence. And a lot of people, this is where they end up quitting. They end up quitting because they're like, okay, well, if I can't make it, if I can't, 
you know, keep winning consistently, if I keep having all these failures and these losses, that means I just need to stop. I just need to stop doing it. No, that's the wrong approach. And number two, you might get negative workshop feedback. And I'm a big advocate for writing workshops because for one, you're around other creatives, you're around other writers, and it also gives you a chance to network with the person right next to you, the other people in the room, and you get different points of view. Like in my example, I went to film school and I remember the first screenplay I ever wrote actually won a competition right back in 2016 and i remember that i had an original idea for that script it was never supposed to be like a period piece set in the 70s during the black panther era right at first i was just gonna make the setting you know present day society modern society but i remember one of my classmates actually gave me the idea he was if you really want to go deep into this, how about you make this a period piece? You're going to have to do research heavily just to make sure it's accurate. But, you know, consider that. And I thought about it and it made sense. But you see, he didn't like criticize me. He gave me constructive feedback and strategy. You see the difference? He didn't tell me, oh, well, this is a stupid story, you know, give up. No, he just gave me a new way to think about it. And it wasn't even the professor that gave me the idea. It was one of my other classmates and it ended up winning a competition. So, and I know a lot of people don't like groups. They don't like being in a group setting for whatever reason, but I'm here to tell you, don't sleep on a group setting because that is where you might get like the information that could help you get into a fellowship, that could help you win a competition. And you might not even realize it until it happens. And then you look back like, wow, if I hadn't allowed myself to be in a group, if I hadn't allowed myself to really you know, be open to feedback and different points of view, I wouldn't have gotten this this win. So embrace it. And, you know, sometimes in a group, I get it. It might feel like everyone's attacking you. It might feel like, oh my gosh, they're all tearing my artwork apart. But there's a difference. If they're giving you strategy on how to make it better, they're not coming for you personally. Now, if they're hitting below the belt and they're saying things like, I don't even know why you're a writer anyway, it's time to find a new group because that's toxic and nobody deserves that, nobody, right? So if, if that's happening, get, get, get out of the group, please. Get, get out of that group, just, just pack your belongings and go. Don't even subject yourself to that. But if they are actually giving you a blueprint lean into it because they're trying to actually help you. And this doesn't even really just apply to writers. This can apply to any kind of artist, a painter, a sculptor. It can apply to um, somebody that's into illustration because I used to take painting classes really for fun and because painting relaxes me and they do the same thing in a fine arts class. They'll have you sit in a circle. They might have your artwork on display and everybody has to say, you know, one positive and one thing that needs work. And it does help. Like it might be, okay, maybe you could have blended those two colors a little bit better. Maybe you could have used a different like painting tool. You could have used, you know, something like this or you could have used, you know, this to make more of a contrast see how that's giving feedback with a strategy and the same in a screenplay it could be well we don't really know like what this character's trauma is so we don't know what space he's operating from so who is this character and then you know what is your character afraid of the most lean into that and then you'll be able to create more conflict you'll be able to create more um, intense scenes. And hi, Joseph, how are you? And yeah, you know, number three, this is another one too, that I want to get into. Tough note script consultant, right? And as a script consultant, I will say this, 
we do have moments where we have to tell people the truth like okay it's getting a pass and when we give people a pass it doesn't mean okay give up being a screenwriter it's over for you no it just means okay you need to go back to the drawing board you need to go back and look at your outline and what i run into a lot is that people don't outline beforehand because they don't want to and then they don't realize oh, I need to outline so that map when I'm writing to make sure that everything is flowing, that the story's moving forward. But a lot of people get tripped up and they get lost in act two because they didn't outline, because they just wanted to get to the first draft. They just wanted to write, you know, from the seat of their pants. And I'm not gonna lie, I used to be like that. I come from a short story background. I used to be just like that. I used to think like, oh, I just wanna get to the story already. I just wanna make sure that I'm able to write out everything that's in my head. And while that's great, that's when a lot of people end up running into writer's block and then they're hitting a brick wall. They're like, oh my gosh, I don't know why I'm lost. I don't know why, you know, I can't figure out why, you know, I don't know where to go from here. And the reason is because you didn't write with the end in mind. And people often are like, what do you mean? I'm like, you have to know how this character is going to evolve because storytelling is about total transformation. Whether it's a novel, whether it's a screenplay, total transformation. And the reason I say that is because in the beginning of your story, your character is living a life of mediocrity. And it's nothing against your character, but be real, right? They don't like their life. They don't like where their life is going. They might be at a dead end job. They might be in a toxic relationship. They might be in a loveless marriage. Their money might not be right. They might not like where they live. It could be anything, right? And now it comes down to what does your character want? And once you have that want, that need, that desire on how they want to change their life, now we go into obstacles into act two where they have to figure out okay how am I going to get what I want what obstacle do I have to face what demons do I have to face to get what I want and that leads them all the way to act three where they've slayed the demons whether you know literally or figuratively and now they are totally self-actualized because now they are living up to their full potential and a lot of people miss that and it doesn't mean oh my gosh i shouldn't be a writer no it just means you need practice it means you need practice you need to read screenplays you need to watch a lot of movies that are in your genre of choice you need to look at the different techniques and strategies that they use not so you can copy them verbatim but just so you can see oh okay that's how they conveyed subtext like oh okay right here that was a really like heart-wrenching scene and it didn't have any dialogue but i was able to really feel something right and why is that because you were focusing on the actions and a lot of people mess up there too with dialogue. They end up believing that, okay, every scene, every moment needs dialogue. Mm -mm. And, and I used to fall into that trap too. Like everything I tell you guys not to do is because I did it. And my mentor ripped me a new one. <laughs> you know, like tough love, of course. Like he was always giving me that constructive feedback with a strategy. And he was always like, okay, be careful, you know, don't micromanage the actors because remember, people still need to play that role. Don't make it to where they can't ad lib and they can't, you know, worry about like, oh, you know, I gotta be like this, this character, but we're not letting them do what's natural to them. They might have a way that their disposition is. They might have a mannerism or a little quirk that they can add to that character so it's a lot of things that go into it but 
I will say, if you're going to hire a script consultant, somebody like me or many others, do your homework on them, vet them, see if they've had results, look at testimonials, what people are saying, because I can't tell you how many people I've had come to me because a script consultant didn't give them any strategy and just told them that they would never be a writer. And I was like, they told you that they didn't give you like any feedback on how to improve they were like no like one person told me that a script consultant said that they were a lost cause and I was like yeah like that's why I'm a big advocate for vetting people because before you spend your money with anybody look at their track record see if you and that person are really aligned and make sure that they understand your goals as a screenwriter like what you're trying to accomplish and that way they can help you from that space too and number four oh that also ties in reading negative reviews like let's say that you write a poem or something like that and it gets published on it and then you know critics there's critics everywhere and they might give a negative review like oh this is not well written oh this is five minutes of my life I'll never get back it's like listen there's always going to be critics there's always going to be people saying that you can't do things and me and one of my connections in the industry we were talking yesterday over zoom about how in this industry you have to know who you are internally in this industry. You cannot allow people to tell you who you are. You can't allow people to make you question your whole life because really when it comes down to it, who are they? You know what I mean? And you also have to ask yourself, where is this person operating from? Like, are they really out here trying to help me get better or are they trying to tear me down and we all know the difference we can feel it like in our spirit our intuition will tell us so definitely make sure that you pay attention to how you feel when you're in the presence of different people and do you feel like they're tearing you apart or do you feel like you're coming away with solutions and you want solutions that are rooted in making you a stronger writer just over time and number five comparing your work now you should read scripts you should read books you should read poems all that stuff but when you get to the point to where you're comparing yourself to another writer that already like quote unquote made it they hit it big for one you're not that person and they're not you and I say that to say that we're all unique. We all have our own strengths. We all have our own shortcomings, right? And nobody ever started like right out the gate, perfect. They've had to revise, they've had to rewrite, they've had to go back to the drawing board and that's just part of it. And a lot of people measure their success by, oh my gosh, I got notes, I'm a failure. Or, oh my gosh, I didn't sell my screenplay yet, I'm a failure. Or, oh my gosh, I didn't get an agent or a manager yet, I'm a failure. And I would ask, you know, do you want to be in the industry or do you actually want to be independent? Because that's another route too. And a lot of people in this industry, believe it or not, are cool with being independent. And I know a few of them personally. They're like, yeah, Jessica, like I wanna come to you for coverage, but my goal is just to go make it on my own because I direct my own stuff too. And they were like, I don't want you know, a manager, I don't want an agent, I just wanna get better at my craft. And there's a segment of screenwriters like that. And look at Issa Rae, she's a great example. Now, you know, now she's in mainstream Hollywood, would, but she started out independent with the awkward black girl series where you know nobody really knew her yet but she made a name for herself by putting herself out there now imagine if Issa Rae had psyched herself out imagine if she had told herself 
oh, I'm never gonna, you know, be like those people in Hollywood. Why should I even try, you know? Like, I know I'm on YouTube, and but it's not the big screen, so I'm not as talented as these writers that are in these writers' rooms. No. Issa kept going, and pretty soon, guess what? Hollywood noticed her. And now she's had a lot of success with the, you know, the Issa series, you know, Insecure. She's had a lot of success as a showrunner. And she wouldn't have been able to do that had she not put herself out there as a creative. And that's what you have to do. You have to put yourself out there and be willing to take the risk, take the chance. And I have five strategies for how you can navigate these challenges and emerge strong and you'll be more resilient and you'll be more confident when it comes to your writing. So number one, you need to reframe criticism as growth. And a lot of people look at criticism, and when I say criticism, I don't mean like just down talking somebody and making them feel this big. No, I'm talking about constructive criticism with solutions. So we have to learn how to view it like, okay, I want to learn like how I can get better. Like, tell me the truth, tell me what I need to do, tell me what it's lacking. And that way we'll be looking at it as a solution-based discussion rather than, oh my God, they're attacking me. And it's, it's not even like that. And then number two, set clear goals. Establishing what you want to achieve can help you stay focused and less swayed by negative feedback. Because some people allow negative feedback, oh, hey, Courtney, to psych them all the way out to where they just stop writing altogether. They haven't written a script in 10 years. They haven't written a book in 20 years. And they have all these ideas in their head, but they're so, you know, worried about what was told to them 10 years ago. And it's still living rent free in their head. That person that told them, oh, you'll never make it as a writer is living rent free in their head another human being that much power that you stop creating for 20 years or more i've met people like that too and it always saddens me because i'm like so what that person said to you 20 years ago hurt you so badly that now you, you you're not writing anything you're just waiting but you're scared to even take the action because that person's dialogue is just going on and on and on. Yeah, don't do that. Please don't do that. Like, if you take nothing else from me, don't be so worried about what other people think because I always say people are going to talk until the day you leave this earth, they're always going to have something to say. And you guys think that I don't get mean comments? Please, I DM people letting them know what I do to help writers. You know how many mean comments I get on a daily basis? And this is why I say to people, you have to rejuvenate your mind on a daily basis. And you have to be, um, what was the word? No, you have to use self-compassion every single day. Because if you are unkind to yourself, already and you're already telling yourself mean things then when other people say it to you you're gonna believe it's true so you have to be your own safe space and you have to be your own best friend especially when you're stepping outside the box like i've had people um oh, I don't know why you're helping writers and da da da, like who are you? I've never heard of you before. When all I have to do is look on my Instagram and they'll see tons of testimonials. All they have to do is go on my website and they'll see a lot of testimonials. Uh, one of my very first clients, 
Um, shout out to Ashley. Uh, she made it into the Writers Guild Foundation. And it was shortly after I had provided development notes for her and really helped her workshop her story. And now she's working at Netflix. You know, she's getting her portfolio together. She's doing great, you know. And that's why you have to know who you are in this industry. Because when you know who you are, nobody can tell you anything about you. You already know within yourself that you have what it takes and you have the talent and you have the drive. You might just need more development, but you're already there. And and also you have to remember people are, a lot of people are operating from a negative space. And sometimes you have to realize that people are committed to misunderstanding you. People are committed to trying to get a reaction out of you because I've had people where you know I've let them know what I do and I have had people give me like nasty comments right where they'll be like well you know judging by all these other scam artists out here like I've had people call me a scammer like I've been called everything in the book to the point where I laugh at it now you know because it's like I know internally that I'm not a scam artist and I'm like you ask any one of my clients how I've helped them they will never tell you that I am a scammer and I can say that with the utmost confidence I can say that looking right into this camera but see if you don't know who you are and somebody says that to you you'll find yourself thinking oh my god I am a scammer so you see why I always say rejuvenate your mind each day, do meditations, do affirmations, do a vision board, talk to yourself, journal, spend time with yourself, reflect. I'm not just saying that as an item, you know, that you need to check off your list. That's something that you need to have mental strength in this industry. And a lot of people sleep on that, but I'm telling you, a lot of these people want to get a rise out of you and if you are not emotionally centered and if you can't process your emotions in that moment then it's going to be really hard for you to navigate because your mind is going to be chaotic and it's going to be all over the place and thank you jennifer glad you're enjoying it and yeah i mean you can't let people knock you off your square you can't let people you know, their rejection make you fear just getting started. And, you know, I have on my computer these sticky notes and they serve as little mental reminders. And I have every no closer to a yes. And then I have on the left hand side, human rejection is God's protection. And a lot of us don't like to think like that. We don't think that oh, well, if I'm getting rejected from this, that maybe God is protecting me from something. We think that, no, if I'm getting rejected, that means I have to force whoever or whatever rejected me to want me. And that's the wrong approach. In business, in life, in love, it's the wrong approach. If something is rejecting you, let it reject you. Don't waste time trying to chase whatever it is. Maybe that was something that was not aligned with what you want. Maybe that wasn't the right agent. Maybe that wasn't the right literary manager. Maybe that wasn't the right, you know, writer's room. Maybe that wasn't the right showrunner. You never know. Maybe that wasn't the right competition for you. And when we start thinking about that and we start saying to ourselves, what is for me is for me, you will have peace even in the midst of rejection. You will have peace even when it seems like opportunities are coming to you. No doors are opening. No, they are opening. You know how many rejections I get during the week? And then do you know how many you know surprising yeses I get during the week? It varies, but you're going to have to sift through those no's. You're going to have to sift through, okay, okay, this person told me no, but oh, two days later, this person actually wants to have a meeting. Oh, okay, they're interested, right? And you can't let that get you down. I mean, if I had let 
criticism from people get me down, I wouldn't be on here talking to you guys. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be on on live wondering oh you know I'd be wondering like oh I don't know if I should do this I don't know if I'm meant to no you have to know who you are and stand on that regardless and number three develop a feedback filter now what's a feedback filter a feedback filter Think of a filter, like, you know, like a water filter, like those Brita filters where you, um, you know, you, you set that up and it filters out like all the stuff that's not supposed to be in there. And then by the time that's over, you have, you know, clear, clean water to drink, right? Look at it just like that, your feedback filter. So you have to identify whose opinions matter the most and filter out the non-constructive criticism. So think of the non-constructive criticism as, you know, all the gunk before you get to the clear glass of water. And then think of the clear glass of water as the feedback with clear strategy that will allow you to go into the rewrite confidently. Number four, and we talked a really the whole time about this, the whole live yesterday, self-compassion practices. Incorporate techniques to maintain self-love and compassion, even when facing tough feedback. Write down affirmations. Download the app um, Insight Timer. That's the app where I meditate, I do affirmations. It's a great app. They have meditation instructors on there. You can find different affirmation practices on there, literally for everything. You can do breath work. You can do whatever you wanna do on there. And it's so helpful because then you're able to really center yourself and ground yourself. And a lot of people wanna skip that process. They want to skip that because they think, oh, you know, it just sounds like, like one of my coaches, shout out to Ari. She says, um, oh, it sounds like airy fairy and all this stuff, but it's really not. That's the secret to a lot of successful people, why they are able to maintain that success and that drive and that confidence. Because guess what? They are renewing their mind every day because your mind can either be your greatest asset or it can be your biggest op and we want it to be our greatest asset because your mind has the power to strengthen you and play tricks on you so you have to be able to catch it like when you find yourself feeling like this negative thought or you feel yourself kind of just you know discouraged you might think to yourself oh what am i gonna do but it's like no I need to meditate about this. I need to journal and write this out, like exactly how I'm feeling. You might even need to cry it out, you know, when you're alone in a safe space. You might need to do affirmations. You might need to pray, whatever it is, you know? And a lot of people think that they can just skip that part and get right to the fruits of their labor. But if you don't have a coping mechanism for when things don't go your way, and trust me, it'll get hard. You have to have the mental strength and the mental fortitude to stay the course, because I'm telling you, so many people quit. So many people are afraid to put themselves out there, and so many people are letting life pass them by. And let me tell you something. Do you know where the richest place on earth is? The richest place on earth is what? The graveyard. And I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm being real. Like, you know how many people have left this earth and they never even attempted to pursue their creative endeavor? They were on their deathbed and they were like, oh my gosh, I have so many regrets. I, I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. And when you ask them, well, why didn't you pursue it? What happened? A lot of the time they'll tell you, well, such and such told me that it was a pipe dream. Such and such told me it would never happen for me. 
and they believed them. They didn't have that level of audacity. Shout out to Coach J, right? They didn't have that confidence within themselves. They didn't really know who they were. And by the time they realized that they didn't utilize their time in the proper manner, it was too late and they were already on their deathbed. So if you don't take anything from me, when, when I say this, be willing to suck at something and get better. But see, that's the problem. We don't want to suck at things. We don't want to, you know, be in a position where we're vulnerable. We're trying something new. We're making mistakes. We're getting failure after failure, loss after loss. And we think that, okay, those failures and those losses, if I was really meant to be doing this, I wouldn't have any failures and losses. Name me a human being that has never had a failure or a loss. And if they never had one, I guarantee you, they played it safe and they never tried anything new. Does that sound like a fun life? Does that sound like an adventurous, spontaneous type of life? No. It doesn't. And, you know, anything great is not met without risk. You know, there's a risk in business. There's a risk in creativity. There's a risk in romantic relationships, marriage, whatever it is. I mean, if we really want to keep it real, we take a risk every day we get in our cars and put the key into the ignition. You know what I mean? We could easily be like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go anywhere. I might get into a car accident. And I have known people personally that don't fly, like get on an airplane any, anywhere because they are afraid that the plane will crash. And they're even instilling in their own children, oh, never fly in an airplane. Ruining that child's sense of adventure before they even get started, right? Telling their eight-year-old child, Oh, no, don't go there. No, no, you know, the plane will crash. So you're raising your child to be scared like you. And you're probably thinking, well, I'm protecting them. No, you're, you're making them walk around fearful, and that's not good. And scared people create more scared people. And that's not what you want. And then number five, this is my last point. Celebrate small wins. And a lot of us don't like doing that. I think I even heard, who was this celebrity? I think it was the rapper uh, Drake who said this, that he never celebrates his small wins because he's always looking for a bigger win. And, you know, I don't agree with that. And I'll be real about why I don't agree. Because if you never embrace the small wins and you don't look at them as progress, you're always going to be telling yourself, well, that's not good enough. That That's not good enough. I could have done better. And then, you know what? Imagine how he's talking to himself when he does that. Imagine how he's talking to himself with the mindset of, well, I can't even celebrate a small win. And I used to think like that. And guess what? I was miserable. I celebrate every win, whether it's, you know, getting up, dancing, getting up, listening to uplifting music, you know, whatever it is, celebrate it. You know, maybe you reached out to a company for a contract deal and they want to set up an appointment with you. That's a win. That's process. And, you know, that's progress, too. And... Oh, yeah, it's okay. I, I'm not like that anymore. You know, I had to get out of that <laughs> because it was making me miserable. It was like making me think that unless I was perfect, I couldn't celebrate anything. And guess what? You will never arrive at perfection as a human. And that's why I had to stop doing that because it's not a good way to live. It, it's going to make you miserable. It's going to make you sick. You're going to be depressed. It's not good. And I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you. So one thing you can do when you have, you know, a win, no matter how small, medium, or large that win is, 
do something that you enjoy, you know, go walk your dog, go have fun, you know, visit friends, you know, go get some ice cream, you know, buy your favorite candy, you know, something, something that's like a reward for you, right? You know, like, go get your favorite treat from the store, um, go buy a nice outfit, something, reward yourself for your hard work, like, I deserve this, you know? Take yourself on a solo trip, anything, right? <laughs> and once you do that, you'll realize, hey, I'm making progress, you know, right? I was here at first and now, you know, now I'm here and I'm, I'm moving up, you know, I'm getting closer. I'm not there yet, but, you know, I'm pacing myself. I'm still going. Th that's how you have to think. That's how you have to think. And whenever you start something new, you will have that little twinge of nervousness that never goes away. Like recently, I invested in a coach that's helping me learn to pitch to corporations, right? And a lot of people tend to think, oh, but I'm just a small business and, and they're a big corporation. Mm-mm. If you get the information and you get the knowledge and you talk to the right people, you will realize that these huge corporations will hire small business owners all day, every day and pay them more than they pay their own employees. I know, right? Wild, isn't it? But a lot of people don't know that. So they think, oh, a, a corporation, uh, like they're going to tell me no. And, you know, they idolize this corporation. But no, you have a problem that that corporation needs. I mean, not no, I said it wrong. They have a problem and you have the solution to said problem. And that's how you have to look at it. You know, whether you're a big, you know, medium or small company, as long as you can provide a solution for their bottom line, they will hire you. And another thing too, don't be afraid as an artist to negotiate what you want. And I see this a lot too. Artistic people, crazy talented people, they tend to lowball themselves monetarily. They tend to, you know, let's say you're a painter, right? And you have these beautiful abstract paintings that anybody would love to hang in their living room. So how much do you charge for that? You charge like $150. Why, right? These people, you, you know how many people pay a lot of money, like top dollar for priceless art? I have known people that have paid between five to 10K for priceless art, okay? Because it meant that much to them. And a lot of people have bought into what society has said to them. Like, oh, nobody's going to pay for that. Oh, you're wasting your time. Nobody's going to pay top dollar for that. Listen, there are wealthy people right now that have abstract paintings, murals in their living room. Right there, right when you walk into their, their house. And I'm telling you, don't let society make you shrink who you are. Price what you are worth. Price what your talent, your gift is worth. And when I say what you are worth, I don't mean you as a person. I mean your gift, your talent, your skill set. Because nobody could ever pay you, like, you know, your worth as a human being. But a lot of people get that confused. They think, oh, I want to charge my worth. And it's like, not you as a person, your skill set what you can do, how you can solve that problem. And I'm telling you, celebrate those wins. Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Don't be afraid to acknowledge it. Don't be afraid to pat yourself on the back because a lot of people mess up with that. And let me see, Courtney, in the military, people could be miserable at all times. Oh, were you in the military? Let me know. Because um, my dad was actually in the military, so I know about that firsthand. <sighs> like, military vets go through a lot. And, like, I'll be so real with you. That's why if I ever have a son, like, 
I don't know if I want him going into the military because I've seen how it can jack people up. I don't know. I mean, not everybody comes back messed up, but a good amount of people do. And a lot of them don't go get the help because a lot of them have PTSD too. So it, it's a lot that goes on. Yeah, and if they saw combat, I'm not saying that there's no cure for them, but the main issue that I've seen, even in my family, is that they have the resources, but they won't go to get help. And that is what ends up making it worse because then they're walking around with this anger, this PTSD, like all this stuff. And it's like, all you have to do is get help. Come on. And, and they don't want to. They want to stay stuck in it. And yeah, it can be hard having a family member that's been in that. But that's why I say, you know, you have to celebrate each win and you have to wake up each day and choose to make it a good day because people don't, they don't understand that being happy within, like true happiness that's internal is a choice. It is a choice. And a lot of people get mad when people say that, oh, happiness is not a choice. I'm like, it is. It really is. Like, it would be so easy to, you know, just complain and go into a whole spiel of negativity. But what's that going to do for you? It's only going to make you more depressed. And here's what you can do. Like, if you're having a bad day, don't ignore the feeling. Think about how you can cope in a way that's healthy. Because not all coping mechanisms are bad or unhealthy. If you are journaling, if you are doing like, like you said, Courtney, your voyage of meditation, see, that's a healthy coping mechanism. That's something that will help you get through the tough days. That's something that'll help you get back, you know, lifted into a higher vibration, you know, but a lot of people... If they do have a coping mechanism, they resort to things like, you know, alcohol, drugs, or they resort to weed, or they resort to, you know, pills, you know, stuff like that. And while it'll temporarily give you that dopamine hit, it won't really help you develop better habits. And then you'll be looking at that vice as a crutch. And... On the opposite end, a lot of people have a food addiction. And see, as human beings, we don't look at food like it's something we can be addicted to. But we can if we don't keep it in check. And, you know, we see people like on that show, you know, like no disrespect to the people on like, you know, that show, 600 Pound Life. But if you really pay attention to the people on that show psychologically, like beyond the fact that they have like, a weight issue a lot of that is because they have been using food as a coping mechanism to cope with whatever trauma they experienced in their life and they're using food as a comfort to self-soothe and that's why now they got to this point but it's really on a psychological level because of what they've been using food as and it's been a crutch so I say all that to say celebrate those wins a little bit of progress every day is better than no progress at all and I'm so serious about that but yeah you guys that's it for the live I might come back later today at 6 p.m. Eastern if I have time because I want to do a live about you know why we don't get even more creative when we age a lot of times and why our creativity tends to decrease and why it even decreases in children once they reach about you know like fourth or fifth grade and I really want to talk about this so I'll be back at 6 p.m eastern today and oh thanks mahogany and oh yeah and buenos dias I need to um learn more of my Spanish. <laughs> That's another one of my goals. I need to take a Spanish class because I took Spanish in high school. Um, 
I definitely need to learn more, especially once I start like really traveling and stuff like that. But yeah, I want to explore, you know, why a lot of people aren't creative and why a lot of people have given up on it and that, you know, it can be restored, but a lot of people don't think that it can. And I'm here to prove everybody wrong that it can get restored. You just have to be willing to do the shadow work to restore it. But yeah, you guys, I'll be back at 6 p.m. And if you're a screenwriter that needs feedback on your script, you're looking to join a group of like-minded writers like yourself, hit me up in the DMs. And if you're a writer that is struggling with writer's block, hit me up in the DMs as well. Talk to you soon, and I'll see you guys later.